Today we'll be studying scripture out of 1 Thessalonians, so if you want to turn there while I'm talking, and I'll give you a little background about the place called Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica was a chief a seaport of um, the city of, or the area of ancient Macedonia, being a bustling center of commerce, trade, and military might. In antiquity, for those of you who might like to do some reading or you're familiar with places that have changed names, uh, Amathia, Helia, and Therma would be names that either before or after, but Therma would be after. Thessalonica was known by several names in antiquity. In the later antiquity, of course, um, the most famous one is Therma, uh, derived from the fact that they had a lot of local hot springs. Um, if you are into history, you'll read about Therma as the name used mentioning the account of the invasion of Xerxes during the Peloponnesian War. Um, there's also all kinds of other interesting history to this place, but um, all I can tell you is that the place was named Thessalonica by Cassandra, who was the uh, he was married, I think, to one of the relatives of Alexander the Great. So when you're married to somebody related to Alexander the Great, you can name a city whatever you want. <laughs> um, so we have an interesting history background, historical background of Thessalonica. But we also have an interesting, interesting history that is recorded for us um, about Paul's travels. Paul and Silas were forced to leave Philippi. Um, they traveled to Thessalonica where Paul taught in the synagogues for several Sabbaths until they were forced to leave the city once again when the religious Jews making accusations um, regarding the converts, they accused them of treason amongst other things. So this kind of situation prompted Paul to leave. He tried to return, you'll read, in the Bible, it says he tried to return, but Satan hindered him. So he sends Timothy in his stead, and it's Timothy who picks up the rest of the ministry there at Thessalonica. Timothy will also return and give the report of what's going on to the Apostle Paul, who then was at Corinth, who would then write the letters, first and second, not at the same time, to the Th Thessalonians. And if you're reading the letter letters, both first and second, you can see typical in Pauline style, but not fully developed as other letters. Most scholars, and I'm part of that camp, put this as very early writing of the Apostle Paul. I would definitely place this, uh, even though my Bible, the um, Zodiotis Bible, I believe says it puts this at either 50 or 51 I'm inclined to believe that it may be even slightly earlier than that for other reasons which I don't want to get into right now. Why is that important? Well, I always say when you're getting into a timeline, you're getting into a book, it really is good to have a little background. If you're at all interested, there's some really good history or historical reading um, about Asia Minor during the years between 30... Uh, we'll say the late 30s up until maybe the year 100 where you can literally see what we don't really probably understand from the letters themselves, which is the amount of persecution that Christians were facing in the first and early years of Christianity. So this is important because, as you can see what I mentioned, those uh, religious Jews that came and stirred up all of this tension um, fueled a lot of political agendas. So it's important to kind of note that in the climate that people, Christians lived under, was very tense. Not like we have, you know, we, we have it really good here, friends. I'll just say that to you. Uh, America is still the greatest country ever at any place in the world. And yes, I'm a very proud American. Anybody who says, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say this. Anybody who says America was never great should leave the country. This is the greatest place on earth. We don't have, 
We do not have, we do not have what most major players, countries have as their standard and norm. Now, when I hear people talk bad about this country, you're asking, why are you talking about the Bible? And you just transition into, that's right. Because if you really see the reality of what we complain about in this country, it's absolutely nothing. When you read about the history of what early Christians went through just to keep their faith, just to maintain and practice their faith, thank God, at least now, I'm, I'm not saying that it will be forever like this because I'm sure that with government encroachment and other factors, agendas and whatnot, maybe one day we will not have the freedom to worship. Maybe we'll be like those pilgrims that got on a ship that came here to be able to have the freedom to worship. But right now we have that freedom. We should enjoy it. We should be proud of it because the history of Thessalonica tells you that as Christians were persecuted, as political agenda, see, some things change and nothing changes. As people were persecuted, political agendas were driven up, and that caused an even greater force, and I'm talking about a force to destroy or to suppress Christianity and the church, which, by the way, if, you, if, if you're reading, hearing what I'm saying, you will be reading between the lines for me to say, we ought to be proud Americans and grateful that we're Christians in a country that is free. We don't have the things the Thessalonians dealt with, and we certainly don't have the things that in our current climate other countries forbid the practice of any other worship than what the state or country permits. So I'm glad we don't have the problems that the ancient Greeks, Asian, Asia Minor had or modern-day people in other countries. And I feel like we should be celebrating. When you read this book and you read what's going on in the world, you say, nothing has changed, but we need to celebrate, not be beaten down dogs, worried about wh where's the next beating going to come from. We are Christians, and we're not impotent. We are Christians, and we're American. We should be proud of all of that instead of people who've turned into cowards and crazy people ranting about everything else except for heralding up our great freedom, which these folks at Thessalonica did not have. It, it is clear if one is reading the contents of First and Th Second Thessalonians that the early church there was dealing with a lot of misunderstandings. There were issues, certainly one of the greatest issues which permeates both First and Second Thessalonians has much to do with eschatology, the things concerning the last days. Um, they were also concerned, the believers, I'm sure that as Timothy spoke with the people, he got the sense, and this is what he must have reported to Paul, that there's a great concern about those people who became Christians, who died as Christians, and their concern was when the Lord returns at the coming of Christ, at what is called the parousia in Greek, the return of Christ, that what about the dead people? They're going to miss out. So Paul writes to give them comfort and understanding about what will happen to those people who died in Christ and we who are alive at his coming. That was one of the main things, whether it was a misunderstanding or not, or somebody came in and perverted what was said, we don't know. Um, also, we can see in First and Second Thessalonians Paul's concern and love for the converts, uh, his anxiety for their spiritual well-being, and his zeal for the Lord. We are going to take a look at one particular verse, although First and Second Thessalonians, you do well if you haven't read them both completely in one reading. They're small, so you can read both in one sitting to reread it at your leisure. Um, and you'll see that there's a lot more information in here Sometimes you read a short letter and you think, oh, there's, there's not too much in here. There's a lot of information and a lot of helps to understand uh, what is going on. Our focus today will be in the fifth chapter and the 23rd verse. And we will be looking at what it says here. Verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God 
your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who will also do it. Now, um, for those people who are new listening to me, if you're reading um, a Bible that has italics in it, the italics are added by the translators for ease of translation, but those words probably are not in the original. Um, so let's start first by picking this apart, and let's talk about this. Kind of interesting, as if you remember, I highlighted in one of the messages in this series out of the Old Testament, um, I am the Lord who sanctifies, the sanctifying one. We ha found another name of God. Well, this is very interesting. The very God of peace is actually something very Pauline in its, uh, the way it's delivered, but it's actually a Hebraism. Uh, you'll find this same God of peace, because Paul repeats it several times. you find this, the easiest one is in, uh, don't turn there because I'm just going to read it to you and then people get lost before I can even come back. Uh, Romans 15.33 says, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. He says it again in, um, um, I read that, 15.33. He says it again in, in 16.20. Um, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. He says it again in Philippians. There's another reference, I believe, that is in Hebrews. But the big thing is this God of peace, which is very interesting because we know the Hebrew equivalent. If we were reading from the Old Testament, we'd have Jehovah Shalom. And you don't really think because God, in, if we're talking about the way God would be translated in Hebrew, we would actually be maybe reading Elohim, Elohim Shalom. But the name of God, the proper name of God in the Old Testament the God of peace, or God is my peace, or God is the peace, or the peace of me. Jehovah Shalom here, the very God of peace. But there's something interesting about the way Paul uses this in every instance of its occurrence. And that is, it is, peace is cessation of againstness. It is, uh, we can define peace as wholeness, a state of being whole or well, depending on if we're using it from a more Hebrew perspective when we use the word shalom, which can encompass many things, including when you greet people, you, say, you can say shalom. But here, the essence of this is more like taking from what we might say that God is not against us. God is not going to hinder us. God is a God of peace. And I don't mean peace as in no war. It's not certainly meaning peace as in no war because Christ even said, I came not to bring peace but a sword. Uh, essentially, when people say, I don't know why, you know, my, ha my household is divided because some in the house believe and some don't. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about, that brother will turn against father or mother. These are the ways that are included in the Bible to tell us not everybody is going to be happy about the good news. So, when he talks about the God of peace, though, I, I kind of I had to stop for a minute and say, don't rush, because there's something so good there uh, in the different examples that I quoted, and I believe that I missed one out of Philippians as well. I want you to think about it this way. God who, the God who is more than able to bring you peace or to give you peace, when Jesus says, peace I give you. In other words, there should be a sense of calm, God is not the author of fear or confusion. There should be a sense of wholeness and there should be a sense of unity between you and the Lord. And we call that our personal relationship with God. So, God of the very God of peace. And then we have our word for sanctify. So let's take a look. And I'm again I'm I am going to do some translation for those folks who are not Greek students and don't like grammar or language that I use. You know what? Even if you don't speak Greek and you don't understand it, try and just try and follow along with me because there are sometimes concepts that, be, that actually crystallize from the Greek much better than if we're reading just a straight Bible verse in English. So let's take a look at what this looks like. And I'm, I'm just going to write a quick translation 
So autos himself, not too much different, but it's the words that we'll look at. De, now, and you can see the word order. This is what I lo love about Greek. The word order obviously puts the emphasis on usually the first word more important, and as you move through the sentence, maybe of lesser importance. So I like the fact that in this verse, the most important word here is himself. Speaking of Christ, there can't be a better way to start. I know somebody said it's not a proper way to start a sentence. Well, it is when the sentence starts with Christ. So um, we have here now, himself now, ho theos, the God, this of Irenis, peace. So you can see what that looks like. And I was tempted to tell you about this in Greek mythology, but too, too much to introduce all at once. I'll talk about it maybe on festival or another program. All right, let's look at this word because this is the word we have been dealing with from the New Testament. Let's write it out in English. We have here the word hagias, hagiasai, and sai, 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 sai. All right, hagiasai, umas, let me go back to the red, and we'll say what is here. May he, and I'm, I'll explain, may he sanctify. What does our King James say? Simply sanctify you holy, right? There is no, just as may he sanctify you. And these are interesting words we'll look at. This word, holotelais, which is in your King James, reads holy. And let's put a number there, 3651, which is our Strong's number. Somebody asked me this week why I keep saying Strong's. <laughs> so I want to just take this opportunity, because listen, there's a lot of new folks, and they don't know, so I want to tell you. Strong's is named actually after uh, a gentleman who basically went through this whole book, the King James because the Strong's Concordance is for the King James only, and basically listed all the words, where they occur, then one part of the Strong's has all the Hebrew, and the other part has all the Greek words. So you can literally look up any word in the Strong's, and if you have a Bible like mine, then you can look at the number I just wrote down for holy is 3651, and then you look up what exactly it is being defined as and you can also see all the words that are related to it, cognates and so forth, in doing so. So hopefully I've answered the question. It's think common knowledge for us, but not everybody has that knowledge, so it's needful for me to make sure get keep people uh, moving along with us. All right, so we have here holetelais, kai, which is and or also, and then holo kleron, um, which is whole, and the reason why I'm doing this is to show you something, 36, 48. So you can know right away that these two words, holotelais and holocleron, are just a few numbers apart from each other, which means they're probably related. Either they're prefix compound or the word itself may be related, which we're going to find out in a minute. And let's keep moving through the translation. I didn't write it all out because I'm capturing most of what I want to capture um, in the words I have here. And if I'm missing anything, I will add it as we go. All right, so we have here, humon, your, your, to, numa, your spirit, and, kai, and, soul, suke, soul, and, body. Now let me just, I'm going to stop here. There, it could, I could keep going on with the verse, but I'm going to stop here right now. Let me do this because there'll be people who are reading and their mind, they're, they're like overstimulated so their mind goes somewhere else and then you don't listen to me because I'm just like you. Discipline your mind, right? <clears throat> right? Hold the thought. I'm holding, I'm holding. Okay, first thing I want to dispense of so you don't even think about it and you're saying, like, why, why say it? Because then you'll be thinking about it. That's right. And then I'm going to tell you to not think about it. Something that Paul does here that has made scholars come up with a lot of crazy interpretations is he lists spirit, soul, and body. 
And why that is problematic is that that gave way to a big argument in the Middle Ages and later when science was advanced enough, we still don't have the answer for it. Should men be considered a dichotomy or a trichotomy for which no one can actually, don't, don't answer. I'm not even gonna answer, I'm not silly enough to answer. Plus, I don't wanna waste time answering that because it's, it's just not the focus of my message. So wipe that out of your brain. Good, Pastor Scott. You think anybody's going to wipe that out of their brain now? No. All right. So what we have here is we have this, we'll call it a short, comprehensive prayer from the Apostle Paul. And what is interesting about what we're looking at? Well, let's look at the first thing here, which is the most important word, this hagiasai. All right? So the first thing I want you to know, and we'll do, we'll take blue, is... Verb, that's the simple part of this. And when I do these um, morphological taggings, even if you don't understand Greek, just hear what I'm saying, and if you, if you just get the gist of it, that's all I'm asking you for. If you want more than that, that's wonderful too. All right, optative, which we don't see very often, aorist, so when we parse, we know what we're looking at, and active. Okay, so... The first thing I want to tell you about briefly is the Greek. I don't talk much about it, the optative in the Greek. There are, in the whole New Testament, there are less than 70 optatives. And an optative conveys the essence of possibility. It addresses cognition, may be used to appeal to volition or will. So there is a big difference even though some scholars say not, there is a big difference between the optative and the subjunctive. Now, for those of you who hate grammar, you're going to hate me for about 30 seconds, and then we'll move on. Optative is, is may, like, may you have much joy in your life, all right? And subjunctive is going more towards the mood of possibility of something that will most likely happen, but you might want to use if, it's a mood of possibility, but different than optative because optative essentially is more like a, if you were trying to be very polite and you were saying something more of a benediction or a blessing to somebody, may you only have good fortune in your life, all right? So the optative is important because what we see is an obtainable wish or an idea, specifically a prayer, and when I say it's used many times to appeal to the will, that's pretty important. But here's a little something that steps outside the box for us. See this active right here? And a horse. Let's focus on that. So when it says himself, now let's go back to the King James. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. The first thing I want to talk about is the aorist and the active. So the active Let's do that. That's the simple one. The active is basically confirming that God himself is the sanctifier. He is the one doing the sanctifying. When I use that this way, I don't want people to get confused. Paul was not writing a theological treatise here. He's writing to the church. We who have been picking apart and studying the Bible know that when he says himself, God, God himself, who is is sending the agent first of his son and secondly of the spirit. So it, we, we have to look at this concept more in a global triune way than just simply God himself acting by himself because we know we read from other places that Christ coming revealed the promise of the spirit and Christ's ascension or his departure revealed the coming of the Spirit, and the coming of, of the Spirit is then preparation for service and also for transformation in the life of a believer or of the believer. So, aorist active in, the, in this verb, when we read sanctify, it is probably better to say, and I wrote it there in, in the English above, may he sanctify you. And the reason why it's important that we put that qualifying may. It is a prayer. It's a petition. But Paul's also setting down understanding about the way, in other words, 
again, he wasn't writing a theological treatise, but if you read the next verse, he says, faithful is he that called you. In other words, the one who called you is faithful to do and to finish the work he started. So, the one who is sanctifying, active, and aorus usually typically represents an act in the past. This can confirm several things for us. Because this hagiasi, or what is being translated sanctify, is in the active, we know, let's again reinforce the idea of what it is not. We do not sanctify, we are not fixing, we are not rearranging, it's God. Again, another confirmation. So when people talk about the few passages, specifically out of 1 Peter, there may be 1 Peter, one reference in the Old Testament, I think there are three or four all in all that say sanctify the Lord God in your heart or something like that. I said I would talk on that as well. That is not any part of that. Even where the scripture says sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, well, the thing is the Lord God or Jesus Christ has to be in your heart in order for that to happen. A non-believer wouldn't understand this. A non-believer, to a non-believer, it wouldn't even make sense. But we're dealing with the one who does the action, the one who does the sanctifying. So that's number one. Number two is these words here. So, hotelais and holocleron. Now, what's interesting about these words? Let's deal with, first with this, um, this word here. We'll write it like this. Holotelais. That's, does that sound, does that look right? Holo, hello. All right. So, that word is a compound. It's a compound. You can see the compound in both places. So, let's isolate the compound. The compound is this, holo, and then the rest of the word together. Now, I'm going to show you real quickly for those folks that are saying, well, you keep mentioning Strong's. Well, let's read what the Strong says from 3651 so you can, especially for the newer folks, get an idea of how this works. Um, 3651, I have a Strong's. It is a not an exhaustive in the back of my Bible. If you have one like mine, you have it in yours. 3651, it says from 3650, and so it tells you the compounds. 3650 is holos, which is whole, all, complete, in extent, amount, time, or degree, especially uh, as a noun or adverb, all, altogether, every wit throughout. So you get the idea there. And then um, if we go to our word, Holotelis, um, complete to the end. And so it's important because people will read this verse and not see something which is there in the Greek. So let's put here total, complete, because that word telais comes from, remember Jesus' words on the cross, tetelestai, it is finished. Telais, so total, complete, encompassing the entire being. Okay, so there's nothing left out. And if you look at this word, holocleron, um, which is just, as I said, a few numbers away, um, 3648. And then I'll, I'll step away from the heavy stuff and we can get into um, stuff that's not language or translation related. 3648. So... Again, they list the compound, complete in every part, perfectly sound, entire, whole body, adjective, holos, and um, the, the rest of it. So let me tell you about the rest of this, because this word comes from lot, inheritance, inheritance. Um, so when we talk about, and go back to reading the verse, and the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly, and then... If I skip over the italics, and your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless. So you can actually, if you want to, scratch out the I pray God, because it's not there. And you can see how the flow goes. It's sanctify you wholly, that first word, totally, completely, through and through. And then, and your whole, that is lot, inheritance. So there's two separate concepts being uh, spoken of here, and this is another one of those you have to be familiar 
to kind of start peeling back the pieces. The holy is the complete individual, but that second word has to do much with, do you remember the word that we looked at several times out of Ephesians where it talks about that part payment, the being sealed with the spirit, the word arabone, do you remember that? All right, so if that is the, I use the coat check. You know, you check your coat, right? They give you a, a, a tag that says when you're ready to go, you have to present your ticket to get your coat back. Well, it's kind of, I explained it like that, that what God deposits, the seal that he places in us of the Holy Spirit is like that coat check ticket that you've received. And when this is ready to be laid down completely, it's turned in, the, de- the deposit is turned in and redeemed for the whole. So this word, holo kleron, when it's basically saying whole, spirit, soul, body, I want you to keep in the back of your mind whole as in the inheritance, the thing that was promised, the part payment, which when we talk about complete or entire sanctification could only occur when this is turned in to receive the full payment. Does that make sense to you? Yay. All right. So, again, what does this say? It says the complete sanctifying or the completion of the act that God performs in us of sanctification will not be finished until I turn in my coat check, until I'm done down here, okay? So as I'm down here, God is working on the transition. I was studying out of Hebrews and reading about the passage we're familiar with, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And if he chastens you not, if he does not train you and put you through what we refer to at times as the crucible or the fire, then you're none of his. Because it's basically Hebrews reads, if you, if you are not willing to receive the discipline or you're not disciplined, and the King James was pretty, back then, they didn't seem to mind putting the word bastard in there. Today, I'm sure somebody will give me a flat because I said it, but it's in the Bible, okay? So don't bug me. Talk to God about it. So what I'm saying to you is very simply, this act that is the transformative uh, method with God, which we're referring to as sanctification, can't occur completely down here. Now, this, if I could dovetail a little bit and kind of branch out to several theological denominations and their understanding, you'd see why doing this type of study would be very useful for people who, for example, coming out of those who come out of the Methodist tradition, would know that uh, Wesley believed in entire sanctification in the individual in this lifetime. And he was very influenced by the church fathers who believed, and it's very split, but who believed that it was possible to have the temptation and the likeness of sin removed out of the individual. The problem with that, as I've been explaining week after week, is that will never happen in your lifetime. You're living a delusion. Even the writings of 1 John say, if somebody says they have no sin, what does it say? They're a liar. Isn't that what that scripture says? If an individual says they have no sin, They're a liar. So let me ask you, how is it possible to form an entire denomination under the auspices that you can be sinless? That goes exactly against what the Bible is saying, including the scripture I keep quoting to you, which is Romans 3.23. All, not some, not a few, not a select group, a gender, a race, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what is that glory of God? Jesus Christ. So you want to tell me that you think your delusion puts you on par with Christ? Are you crazy? Because that's delusional. And it's also error. What is true is we are constantly at war internally. The spirit of God inside of us, that part payment, and the flesh of the individual will spend the rest of your life on earth 
fighting back and forth. You know, the flesh is very powerful. How many know that? The flesh is very powerful. Have you ever tried to not succumb to something? Just, just say, I will not have a piece of cake or any sugar, any sweets. Just say that. And you'll see how strong the flesh is. The flesh says, you want it. You know you want it. No, you know you need it. Go have it. <laughs> now, I'm being stupid because obviously it's a bad example. It's just food. But it works the same way. This is why when we read about the temptation of Christ, he says, man shall not live by bread alone or cake, but by every word <laughs> that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, right? So it's important for us to understand, yes, temptation will come, and yes, we can we can quote the scripture that says there is no temptation known to man, but such as common to man, but that God has not provided with that temptation a way of escape. This is true. Knowing the Bible and knowing the word makes you, uh, you have a little bit more equipping that when the temptation comes, you can, if you're going to take a second and put the brain on pause to go and look in that book and say, I know a promise of God or a word of God that is equal to my temptation and I will learn that promise or that word or that verse that will help me to overcome. Can we overcome? Absolutely. Otherwise, Christianity is crazy if you walk around in defeat or in the shoes. <laughs> Some of you are looking real serious right now, okay? And I don't like it. I like to be serious, but some of you are like, hmm. So what I'm saying to you is we can be victorious in our faith, but we're not victorious like somebody might paint this as once you're a Christian, every, every day is a home run. Every day you just keep going and it's win, 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 win. It doesn't work like that. The way my Bible tells me in my life experience, it's a whole series of these ups and downs and a couple of good whackings from either the devil or from God that gets you picked up again on your feet and you start all over. So what Paul is saying here, there is a work that was started in you. God is working the work. Remember the verse of Scripture that says he's faithful to, to finish what he started. But that finishing process will not happen in your lifetime. In other words, all the training, it's all being accumulated. Don't think of it as this straight line because you will have these, what I've just described, even with your learning, even with the transformation. You might make two steps forward and take about ten steps back. Then you try again, you get up again, you start back, and you see even the references that are in the Bible help us to understand. I don't think that when an individual starts to really apply the Word of God, I don't think that being made clean through the Word, or we looked at last week the word catheterized, I don't think that means... No, I know it doesn't mean that you will be sinless or you won't fall into temptation because there's the possibility, that optative or even subjunctive possibility that you might succumb. Because God, God doesn't take away. He says, I'm putting you there and you're going to be right in the midst of everything. I'm not going to shield you. That's how we learn. That's how we come to understand more about God. Through his word, he tells us. And the more we come to know him, we can read verse 24 and not just read it, but have confidence, faithful to see that calleth you, who will also do it. He'll finish. But why am I telling you that this whole event that we're discussing is not finished in our lifetime? Well, the answer is right there in front of you when it says your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the coming, the word coming in the Greek, this word that occurs in our text, which is 3952, is this word, parousia, which is always used of the return of Christ. So, you know, you could read this and say, and you preserve blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and not see the Greek word, which tells you unequivocally that it's speaking of the end of time. Or we'll call it the beginning of the end of time. That's a better way to say it. So when people talk about 
the sanctification that occurs in the believer. And I'm begging you, please, this is probably the most important thing. Otherwise, you'll walk around frustrated and you won't be able to figure out, well, how could these people be saying that? Because that's a lot of what happens within Christendom. Some will say, oh, my pastor said this. Well, put prove to me. Show me where you're getting the information that can be anything else. But I'm showing you through the grammar, which is why I like to use the grammar or the Greek, because we see words, verbs, forms, tenses, or aspects in the Greek that we cannot see in the English because the English is just not as precise. So the one thing we can know, put a note somewhere on this page for verse 23 about this parousia, it is the coming, the return of our Lord. And we can say we're, we're to look for the coming of our Lord, we're to be looking for him all the time, which is what the first Christians were doing. But the idea is that when that time comes, the beginning of the end, and I like saying it that way, that's a better way to say it, this is when what Paul is writing will happen, and not before. So the process has begun. Let nobody tell you that you are entirely completed in this lifetime, here and now. That is not biblical. That is not what's being said. Plus, I don't know about you, but this is my, my thought. And it's a personal thought. When I have an opinion, I tell you it's opinion. If I don't say it's an opinion, it's coming from the book with solid footing. My opinion on this subject is that there's going to be a lot of people because this is not taught properly and because people don't understand. There's going to be a lot of people that will be surprised. Whether we are dead or alive when he returns, my guess is the church world is going to be shocked. And the reason for that is very simple. You know, the passage of the prodigal son, the son strays away, he takes all of his money that was his inheritance, and he blows it all. You know, whether he was having a good time making merry with the women or eating sumptuous fare, whatever it was, but he blew it all. And that passage tells me a lot because that about face that the prodigal son does when he says, in my father's house, there's enough bread for essentially for everyone. And he makes an about face. He says, I have sinned. And then begins his journey to return home and it is in his few steps taken that the father runs to meet him for your two steps God will probably take 20 but my point is that the pro even the prodigal son could recognize who he had sinned against he could recognize the right thing to do which is turn back and go home at least there there was the presence of the Lord in the house of his father and whether the, the parable expands beyond that or not, he at least knew God, and he knew who God was. He knew who God the Father was enough from the, from the parable to recognize that we know when the Father saw him, he said, he didn't, the Father didn't say, who are you? Do I know you? Now, I've said this before, I'll say it again. We get to know somebody how. How do you get to know somebody? You spend time with him. Now, we know that in the flesh. You make a new friend. You meet somebody. How do you get to know him? You spend time with him. You hang out and you chit-chat and you find out, oh, I, I, I like the personality or I like those ideas or that person's crazy. I don't want to be associated with them, right? But you get to know them. So as much as, say, you now really, you know them quite well and you're walking down the street and you see your friend, hey, George, it's me. Do you remember me? We, oh, yeah, come on. Let's, let's, you know, let's go grab a cup of coffee and catch up. That concept, take that straight to the Bible. Don't think for a second where people think, oh, I just have to be good to make it in. You've got to know who God is, which means this is why we do what we do, to, to learn more about God. We spend time with him. Whether you spend an hour on Sunday with me and maybe an hour during the week or some time reading or whatever, this is how you come to know God. You don't come to know God by osmosis. You don't come to know God by thinking good and positive thoughts. You know him by the book. And as you get to know God's ways, which God's lament to the children of Israel versus Moses, Moses knew God. The children of Israel only saw the acts or the actions of God, but they didn't know who God was. They didn't know the living God of Israel. So my point is, as we come to press close and try and build a relationship by knowing 
by reading, by understanding, by spending time, I have no doubt that even if my understanding and your understanding is slightly faulted because we're human, our, even our thought process is imperfect, but even if slightly faulted, the attempt through this book to know God, God is looking on all of this and he's, now let me speak for me and I'll make the example of me, but I want you to apply it, it applies to everybody. When I first started reading the Bible, I didn't know a thing about God except I thought I could say God is good, God is all powerful, and God must be very, very, very old, right? When I first started reading the Bible, those were my thoughts. They were very simple. They were very silly. Now I come to start reading, and I, I see God was trying. In the Old Testament, God was trying to show the people. He demonstrated. He showed impossible acts, miraculous things, and the people still didn't care to get to know him. We have our New Testament, which begins with the birth and the coming of Christ, the first time in the flesh. And basically, the whole time, if you, if you think about it, even the disciples are a microcosm of what I'm saying. The disciples spent time with Jesus. They got to know how Jesus was. And that's a little bit more complex, but they got to spend time with him. So when the time was prepared where he went away, the promise of the Spirit coming reminded them of all the things that their friend, before I say Messiah, had said because they didn't know until he'd fully ascended. This is the thing. Well, I'm sorry, until he'd resurrected and ascended, fulfilling the promise that he had made, the promise he'd declared, which leaves the last promise of his return. But my point is they knew him because they had spent time with him. Lucky rats. We know him because we spend time with him, blessed people. So it's really important that we get this right. We're not learning about something we do. We're not learning about some work. We're learning about what God works in us, the work that only God can do in us, that he has started, but will, he will complete this. People who speak of death and dying and are petrified about death and dying, I'm going to say this to you. This even dovetails into that, the promise of resurrection, the promise of eternal life. Why are we being, let me ask you this because it's kind of a crazy question. Why are we being transformed on the inside to the image and likeness of Christ if when we die, all we do is we die in the image of light and likeness of Christ? It makes no sense to me. But what does make sense is when I die, I die in the image and likeness of Christ in my soul, in my spirit, and that which is the knowing God that can return to God. Without that, this is why that scripture that says, without, follow peace without, with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. Is it beginning to make sense that this wonderful gift that God is doing is not something that we should say, I'm doing this thing. There are full denominations that take credit for saying because they believe that there must be active participation we're talking about sanctification now, not justification, sanctification. They believe that there must be active participation on the part of the believer. There's a full denomination that holds this doctrine that as much as God is working, you are working. And now I'm going to say this to you. If I'm working to bring this on, then it's not of God. And if it's not of God, then I'm just a phony $3 bill, and so are all of you. It must be all of God. This particular act, there are things I must do. I must have faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes when I see, oh, God came through. God is really real, and I be, my faith begins to grow. And I might pray, Lord, increase my faith. Give me the gift of faith. But this one thing that I'm discussing today is God doing. And the only thing that I can say apart from faith is the yielded heart, which I spoke about of Romans 6. To whom ye yield your members, you will be servants to whom ye yield. If you yield it to the flesh you'll serve the flesh. If you've yielded to the spirit, you'll serve the spirit. So the whole concept here is something that is going on. And the wonderful thing is, I'm going to go back to this verse for just one second. I want you to look at the word preserved. I should have made you just circle words, but look at that word preserved. From the Greek, it is terithain. Here's another interesting thing and a great way to end the message. This word in the Greek, Greek is Literally, the translation is keeping the eye on, to keep guard, to watch in completion, like to watch 
with intent or focus. So when it says preserved, God is watching. You know, if you believe that God, it says God knows the number of hairs on your head, God sees each tear that we shed, if you believe that, then you must also believe that God is able to preserve. That is, he's keeping an eye on you. Somewhere else in the Bible it says you are the apple of his eye, you are his treasure. He's keeping an eye on you and on me, not as some policeman ready to pounce and uh, write you a ticket and arrest you, but keeping an eye on you like a loving, heavenly father watching his children, sometimes extremely grieved at our stupid behavior towards him, and other times well-pleased because he sees the heart, and even if it is a feeble and failing attempt, he sees the heart that desires him and more of him than anything else. So, What I hope you leave with today is a proper interpretation of this verse and the reality of what God is doing. Now, I have to ask you this question, and it's not rhetorical. We spend money as consumers, as individuals, we spend money to improve our health, to improve our looks. We spend money to pretty much do anything. Some of it's uh, we buy things to make us feel good. But what about this one thing that anybody listening to the gospel should desire that only God can do. You know, as I said, we try to change our exterior or or embellish it or make it better. People work on themselves. But what about the work that God is doing? And to me, that's where it becomes this wonderful thing because that, that word I just looked at, preserved, that's a passive thing. That means I don't have to work at anything. God's going to be doing this for me. He's taking care of something for me. And there, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling when you think about it because I didn't, I didn't ask, but God came. I, I may have been looking or searching, but when God came into my life, and I know God was already working in my life, I can read this verse and say, and God was doing this changing work in me, which I said, If if you've been a Christian long enough, you can look back from where you started. And suddenly you see things about you. If you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, in my case, say, I'm going to call it a generous 25 years. For some, it may be 50 years. And please don't say you were born in a Christian home, so ever since you were born, because it doesn't work that way. That's just a, it's like the kid that said to me, I said the Lord's Prayer in the back of a car. That means I'm saved. You know, a kid's only five. It's cute, that's cute, but until you understand what Jesus Christ has done for you, you don't understand salvation. Until you understand what God is doing in you, you don't understand sanctification. And until we understand that God's promises to do these things are to those people whose hearts are towards him. Why wouldn't you want your heart to be towards him when you know that his heart is committed fully towards you, to changing you on the inside to be what I've called the you that you were destined to be. Now, with all that being said, God's doing this wonderful work. I don't know why we would want to take any credit for it. I want to stand back and say, I'm watching a miracle, even though I can't see and I may not recognize the changes day to day, but I tell you long enough, and you look back, and suddenly you see, yeah, there's a lot of things that have changed, but they're not, I didn't, I didn't try to change them. I basically yielded, and God said, okay, this might hurt a little bit, (laughs) but it'll be worth it. You'll see. It'll all be worth it. So what I'm saying to you is don't think that all this happens down here and you'll live your life as a perfect, sinless creature. Oh, the dimension, by the way, of the deposit of God, that's sinless. What is of God cannot sin. That's speaking of the Holy Spirit depositing you. But everything else, come on. So what I'm saying to you is we have this wonderful gift and the importance of understanding what God has promised to do and that he's able and faithful to finish the work tells me we need to stay the course. We need to, we need to keep learning about God. We need to stay on track and keep faithing. And as the changes occur, as I said, I maybe won't be aware of them, but I guarantee you, Any of you in the sound of my voice, I'm going to use 
an easy number. You've been a Christian for 25 years. Raise your hand. That's a couple of you. Anybody meet somebody, say a childhood friend or somebody you haven't seen in maybe 30 plus years, or maybe they knew you 25 years ago, and they, they've said something to you like, wow, you changed, or you, you go to church? Because you were the person 25 years ago that said, not me. I ain't doing that. That's for stupid people. And here we is, right? <laughs> so what I'm saying to you is change does happen. And I, I in ministry here, have seen... I'm nobody's judge, so when people make changes or changes happen, that's one thing. But you know when God is doing it. You know when God has done something. I always say, just like the people recognized Moses had seen God because his face shone, but he didn't know that his face was all shiny and bright because he had been exposed to the Shekinah glory of God. We have that microcosm exposure. We can't see it. But I guarantee you, in a space of time, where people haven't seen you for a long time, they see it. It's usually the first thing they'll say is, did you do something different? And I'll say, no, I'm just older than when you saw me. No, 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 not that. Something different about you. The hair? No, not that. Well, th those are the only things that might have changed, right? No, not that. Something else. And, of course, they can never articulate. It's something to them that's ineffable. They don't know exactly what it is. They can't articulate it. I'm telling you, I know what it is. It's God. And thank God that God didn't give up on me and didn't give up on you, but he kept going. And if we remain faithful and remain the house of faith, he will take us straight through making the changes as we go to that perfect change once we are in his presence. Can't wait, but until then, we'll just keep getting to know him better and better. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.